Uh, thanks, Pete. Uh, so it's a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce Bob Hall today. Uh, when we met almost a year and a half ago to put together a list of plenary speakers, uh, I was very happy that we were hoping to get a stream and river person to come and talk to us. And I must admit, the very first person to pop into my head was Bob. So I'm very, very happy he agreed to come and give the plenary today. Uh, Bob Hall, just a little background, got his undergraduate at Cornell University. Uh, he then went on and did his PhD at the University of Georgia in the Institute of Ecology, and then followed that up with a postdoc at the Institute of Ecosystem Studies, uh, now the Cary Institute. And I'm going to kind of keep this pretty short. I've had the great fortune of being able to attend meetings and become a close friend of Bob's and collaborator, colleague over the last 20 years, and, and uh, it's just been a real pleasure for me to kind of be able to share those last 20 years and share the science and and have some great conversations over those years. So I'm going to keep this very short. Um, Bob's going to talk to us about uh, metabolic signatures and stream and river ecosystems. I think it's going to be a great topic. It's going to continue and be complementary to a lot of the things that we've been talking about in some of the sessions uh, up to this point. So with no more uh, uh, wasted time, I'll introduce Bob. Thanks, Steve. Can everybody hear me on the microphone? All right. OK, I'm going to talk about metabolic signatures of streams and rivers today and address this idea of how we can use these time series of oxygen to be able to, uh, to, be able to interpret processes that occur in rivers. And this is going to harken back to Emily's talk yesterday, where she described a temporal ecology. And so a lot of what I'm going to do today is a temporal ecology. It also so happens we have a lot of space involved, too. Um, uh, this site is right here. It's one of the most productive rivers I know. It's the Green River in, uh, in, in Wyoming. Uh, this project is not just me, and so I've been working a lot with a bunch of other people to make this work happen, and when you see how much data we have, you'll understand why no one person could do it. And so uh, this part of this work is a, is a NSF macrosystems project where some of the ideas I'm going to talk about came from in developing this work. We're just now starting to collect data for it. USGS Powell Center, which has synthesized a lot of data. Uh, the Klamath Basin uh, work group, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Here's some folks from the uh, Powell Center, Emily, uh, Emily Bernhardt, who's, uh, who's the leading our macrosystems, um, Ted Stetz, who's leading the Powell Center project, Charles, who's a pretty good modeler, Jordan Weed, I have no idea where he is for this photo, he checked out. Uh, Emily Stanley is taking the picture. Allison Appling has done a lot of the computer work and the modeling that I'm going to talk about. Uh, wouldn't, it wouldn't happen without her. Laurel is a freelance post-master's student in my lab doing a lot of the research on the uh, Klamath River. That's her right there in the very green. Maitha Reuta has the, probably the best data set for, uh, uh, for uh, her colleagues, has probably the best data set for metabolism on the planet right now. And then I'm sort of to the left of that arrow giving the talk. One thing is OK to tweet this. And the reason why is all the data are in the public domain, and all the code is online for you to go see. And uh, we'll have more to say about that later. But everything here is open. Uh, no secrets. OK. We're going to talk about ecosystem metabolism today. And this is going to be very much in line with a lot of stuff we've been hearing about over the past couple of days and some of the sessions I've been hanging out in. And so what are we going to call, what do we define as this ecosystem metabolism? Gross primary production, the conversion, the reduction of CO2 into organic carbon by photoautotrophs. Uh, ecosystem respiration, the, the mineralization of this organic carbon back to CO2. And this is what's happening underwater in streams and rivers. And this is, this is this central process right here. And this central process drives a, a lot of things that we care about. And so this morning, we heard a whole lot from John Cole about the CO2 exchange from the atmosphere. A lot of the CO2 that is supersaturating in lakes and streams, some of it anyway, is coming from metabolism within that ecosystem. So this is a flux we care about. Another flux we care about is this organic sea ends up becoming food for animals, heterotrophic microbes. We care about this stuff. Uh, what, is the trophic, what is the basis of production in streams and rivers and lakes? And then 
Um, streams and rivers process a lot of carbon from the watershed. And so there's a lot in its inputs that converts to this organic sea pool and may, and may then be respired to CO2 into the atmosphere. Or it can be stored and, and or exported. I um, heard a talk this morning on storage of organic carbon. So all of these things are part of this, are part of this, uh, are part of this um, metab are part of ecosystem metabolism. All right. So how do we measure this at the ecosystem level? And so there's lots of ways to do these in small chambers. The way we've been doing it is by measuring it at the reach scale. And essentially, what we're doing is we measure oxygen. We measure oxygen uh, concentrations. And so, so this direction would be photosynthesis, um, creating oxygen. This move this this direction is respiration. And then we have a gas exchange with the atmosphere. And we measure this oxygen through a dial cycle. We assume, uh, for the purposes of converting this to carbon, which I'm not going to do too much of today, we can assume a one-to-one -one, uh, carbon to oxygen relationship. Um, uh, that we saw a talk today that shows that that's not always the case. And then also, if you saw Aaron's talk this morning, the whole carbon to oxygen thing is way more complicated than um, I'm willing to admit. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so with that caveat, we're just going to stick with oxygen. This is an old technique. Uh, this method was invented by uh, two guys, Sargent and Austin, in, in the, in the, in the, essentially in the mid-40s. They figured out how to measure the change in oxygen across a coral reef and convert that to metabolism. The Odom brothers, not being stupid, took this method from them with, appropriate, uh, with, with, an, with an appropriate uh, uh, complement here, ingenious flow rate method. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say ingenious is an understatement. And, uh, and they used this to calculate um, metabolism in a week, in a week a toll. And then later, uh, 60 years ago, uh, just in April, uh, Tom Odom adapted this marine method for fresh water. So this is an old technique. So conceptually, we're not doing much new here. What's new is that we have faster computers uh, and, and better sensors. And it's going to allow us to do things that, that Odom could not have, could not have, uh, could not have thought about. All right, and this method is applied in a lot of different habitats. So today I'm going to talk about streams and rivers because that's what I do. There's a lot of work in estuaries, lakes. Uh, this is a cool study showing the spatial, spatial patterning of metabolism in lakes. And then possibly the coolest paper I've read in a year is this one where they're getting oxygen data off a glider in the Pacific Gyre and they're able to look at sub-percent uh, di uh, dial variations and calculate metabolism, if you will, of the, of the, of the, blue, water, of the blue water ocean. That this 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 paper is completely nuts. Um, okay, and so in streams we've done this a lot, and so here's a compilation of data, uh, and these are mostly single day estimates where you go out and we measure metabolism on any one day, and uh, and we and we get lots and lots of variability in the uh, in the in the data, and uh, and and what I've got plotted here is I've got primary production on the x-axis. Uh, log scale, log scale ecosystem respiration on the y-axis, and each of these is a measurement. We see a big diversion from this one-to-one -one line here because the, the classic story is that streams are heterotrophic, and, and we see this in these data. Not too many on this side of the line, where, where which are autotrophic on that day that they were measured. That's the key thing, and so we so we see this big range of variability. Okay, so then what happens when we um, plot metabolism from one stream. This is Walker Branch from Brian Roberts' paper. Uh, and this is one stream. And you can see that one stream over two years encompasses almost the range of variability that we see in, uh, in a whole bunch of streams. So what this says is that there's a tremendous amount of variability here. And we ought to be learning from this variability. So instead of taking these snapshots, let's go look at this variability and try to use this to interpret how uh, how, how streams uh, interpret causes of stream, uh, variation in stream metabolism. All right. And so this time series of metabolism we're going to do for many streams and rivers. And this is enabled by a couple of things. One is we have lots of oxygen data. So instead of staying up all night doing, as, I, as I Aaron alluded to earlier, instead of staying up all night collecting data and doing winklers on them to calculate metabolism, which is what Odom did, um, 
Uh, now we have sensors, and these things are everywhere. People, water management agencies uh, are collecting these oxygen data, and they're collecting them for water quality purposes, and these data are, and, and if they're collected through a dial cycle, we can calculate metabolism on it. How do we do that? We do this with new modeling methods. And so we can estimate, um, we can estimate this gas exchange parameter from the oxygen data itself. It used to be we would, we would have to guess at it or fit an equation or do a tracer gas experiment. We're now able to calculate uh, gas exchange from the oxygen data using these metabolism. And so I've been spending a lot of my time thinking about how to do this. Um, and then once we have these time series, we can then, uh, we can then um, convert these data to ecological understanding. And I will be spending some of my time today talking about this. And here is just an example of one of these uh, data sets. This is the raw oxygen data. Well, in fact, it's just oxygen saturation data from the Menominee River uh, in Wisconsin. And you can see these big pulses of productivity in an otherwise low productive, uh, low productive year. There are lots of these data out there. And so as part of the Powell Center, we have uh, collated, um, this is bit, mostly Jordan Reed and Allison Applin who have done this, have collated all of these data from uh, various, uh, various sites, various rivers. And we have about 300 sites, 350,000 days, give or take a few hundred thousand of, of oxygen metabolism that we can calculate. And so this is becoming a big computational challenge because be, you know, before you had a spreadsheet, it would take me a day to calculate metabolism. Now we've got to do this you know, 100,000 times in a day. Um, or, or at least program and let the computer run off and, and do it on its own. Um, and so how do we do this? How do we, how do we, how do we, how, what's the actual procedure for the calculation? And like I said, this is the stuff that I've been spending too much of my time doing. And essentially what we're doing is we're going to make models of oxygen. And so we're going to say that the oxygen at time t is what it was, say, 10 minutes ago, times a productivity term right here. So here's primary productivity. Um, and then a normalized to the amount of light. So this is a linear light function model. Um, we borrowed this from uh, Van de Bogart, 2007. Uh, and this is just one possible model. Uh, and then ecosystem respiration. And then this gas exchange term multiplied by the DO deficit. And, and we'll solve this model for, at the very least, primary productivity and ecosystem respiration, and maybe also gas exchange, if we don't have any information on gas exchange from, say, a tracer, from a tracer gas. So, and so, like I said, this is one model. There's plenty of other ones that we could use. There's plenty of other ones that we could use. Uh, and then how do we estimate these parameters? And so an easy way is just some sort of nonlinear minimization scheme. Take the oxygen data, fit them to a model, and we'll get parameters. That's great, except we don't really, it's hard to get the uncertainty on those parameters. And then you run into dangers of over-identified models. And so in some cases, ecosystem respiration in K can co-vary perfectly so that you really don't have any information on either of those two parameters when you solve them. And nonlinear minimization schemes are happy to give you an answer, um, but that answer may be wrong. And so we've been spending a lot more time, we're using Bayesian approaches, using um, computational, Bayes, computational Bayesian, using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And this allows us to get, uh, the solution method allows us to get the uncertainty on the parameters. And that's, and we can also use prior information so that if you do have a gas exchange, you can use that as a prior in the model um, if you did measure it. Uh, with the time series, we're working on techniques now to hierarchical Bayesian approaches where we fit an entire model, say a year's worth of data, uh, with, uh, with gas exchange on each day as a free parameter, but we're, we're pooling that um, across all days. So the prior on any one day is the mean for all days, or the mean is conditioned on discharge. And so this is a way of using information in all the days to try to estimate what gas exchange is. And that's what enables us to fit these harder, this, these hard, to, hard to estimate gas exchange. And so with it, it's, in fact, easier than to get gas exchange from a time series of data, a year's worth of data, than it is on any one day, because we have a lot more information with a year of data. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's been sort of the key to being able to do this on these large time series. OK, so here's just one day's worth of data that I fit, so it's easier to see. This is Spring Creek. It's across the street from my house. Um, and what we, have, uh, what we have here is the gray points of the data. The black is the model fit. Here's primary productivity. This is a Bayesian fit. So this is a 95% credible interval on a, on, a, on, a, on a process and observation error model. 
and, and then here is the gas exchange of the error of 21 to 30. Um, almost all of this modeling is open source code. Um, Allison has been leading the development of a uh, package called Stream Metabolizer. It's on GitHub. And so right as soon as this talk is over, or right now if you feel like if you get bored, you can open up and you can start looking at some of these models in the code. It's all there. And this is going to be a very flexible technique. It'll have likelihood approaches, Bayesian approaches, hierarchical. And we're always thinking about different ways of doing this. So the code is changing and it's changing pretty rapidly. And so, and so, we're, and so you can watch us develop this code. You can take it anytime you feel like it and use it on your own projects. And that's what we're doing it for. So please use it. Please use it. OK, so then we can take this and we can fit this. I just showed you one day of data. Here's, here's our primary production, respiration, and gas exchange for 30 days. And this is one of these hierarchical fits with pooling across days. And so we can do this for just uh, we can do this for a few days here. This is just a month in, of Spring Creek last fall. Um, or you can go really long, and you can uh, have 15 years of data here. So this is 15 years of daily metabolism for a river in, in the Basque country of Spain. And so this is data from Maita Oroita and, her, and uh, her colleagues up there. And I'll have more to say about this data set in a minute. All right, so as part of the Powell Center, we've done this for many, many rivers. And so here is, you know, if you could take everything we did and put it into one slide, this is it. And, uh, and this slide is the average metabolism of 187, of 187 rivers. And this is the time series, the annual time series for this. And you can see, because we did this in the US, we have, a, we have a seasonality in the primary productivity, a seasonality in the respiration. And then net ecosystem production is negative. And that's just good because most rivers receive allochthonous inputs from outside them that make them, make them heterotrophic. And, and, then, and then these, uh, and then the, the turquoise and, and sort of um, goldenrod color down there are, uh, are the intercortile ranges. And so there is the. And, and then, and then, and then uh, integrated under these curves, you get 170 grams of carbon per meter square period. That's the average for the for the for the, the rivers that we've done so far. All right. So, what are the controls on stream and river metabolism? And so, for primary production, it's going to be things like light, um, nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, for example, water temperature. These are going to think uh, these things will increase metabolism. Things that are going to lower metabolism are bed movement during, during floods, water clarity, so turbid water shuts out the light. I'm keeping that different than light because uh, water clarity is, uh, is, is independent of the solar insulation. It's landing on top of a stream or a river. And then maybe also benthic grazing. Um, for ecosystem respiration, the primary control is going to, in many ways, is going to be, uh, is going to be um, primary production. I'll talk about that in a second. And the amount and quality of the allochthonous inputs. Uh, and then also, again, temperature, and then scouring bed movement, getting the stuff, getting, getting some of the organic matter that's on the bottom removed. Now, these physical factors vary in time. These controls vary in time, and they vary at different time scales, ranging from short time scales to long time scales. And we argue we can use these variation in time to deduce their cause, uh, how that they affect variation in primary production and respiration in a stream. And so that's what we're going to spend some time talking about. All right, so thinking again, sort of hypothetically, we can have a stream here. And so here's time, a year's worth of time. And then here's, say, metabolism, GPP, gross primary productivity. And so light and nutrients will set the potential primary production. Um, high nutrient stream might be up here. And then we see we have this curve because of light is varying through the time because we're in the northern hemisphere. And so this sets the potential primary production. So in the absence of any, any, any disturbances, that's what primary production is going to be. But then disturbance and water clarity, these changes are going to set the actual. And they're always going to be less than the potential. And they're going to go down. They're going to bounce down and then bounce back up again at some response rate. And so, so that's going to be what drives a lot of the dynamics in these metabolic signatures. All right, so here's some scenarios then that we could think of. And so we'll start here in the upper right-hand corner. So here's solar insulation. This is the amount of light hitting a river, let's say. Uh, and then here is flood frequency is just one measure of disturbance. So here we have a stream that never floods that is wide open. So here's this, 
this is this stream's going to reach its potential. It's going to be it's going to be have high primary productivity. It'll be higher in the summer than it will in the winter, just because of solar insulation. Jump down to this lower quadrant. Here we have a lot of floods, and what's going to happen is a lot of light, and it's going to bounce back. It's going to go down, and we might see this. We might see it occupying this full range of high and low metabolism, depending upon the flooding. Up here, we have a river that's, say, canyon-bound or in a forest or something like that. Or, no, excuse me, in a for we'll call this a forested river. So this is in a forest, and so primary production might be high in the leaf-out times of year and low and when the leaves are in because the light is being blocked. And then here, this sad river is getting flooded all the time, and it is, uh, and, and, and it, it is uh, getting, and it's getting low light, and so it's just going to have perpetually low primary production. So there's two physical drivers and how that might affect what the, the metabolic signatures. All right, another way to think about this, um, sorry to just, well, keep dumping all this theory on you, we'll get to data in a minute, um, and is, is thinking about this uh, actual versus potential in two dimensions. And here we're going to combine respiration and primary productivity in, a, uh, in this space. And so here, if there's lots of light, um, low nutrient, lots of light, lots of nutrients, and low disturbance, we expect metabolism to sit down in this quadrant. High primary productivity and high respiration. Now here I'm defining high respiration as negative. It's a negative flux, which is why it's down here. And so, so, so we have, so we have a lot of primary productivity and a lot of respiration of that primary productivity. If it lies to the right of this dashed line, it's autotrophic. So in other words, there's leftover carbon. Um, at the end of the day. And then here uh, in this heterotrophic space is where there's inputs coming in from the watershed. And so at this part, we might have light limited, large terrestrial uh, uh, carbon inputs. So this might be a, a classic forested stream where we have low primary productivity, really high respiration rates. Now what happens is add in disturbance, a flood disturbance or low light um, and we're going to push towards the origin here. And so where there's very low primary productivity or very low res uh, respiration, um, could be really low light or flood disturbed. And so we have this space that we expect to see where, uh, where metabolism sits. Where we can't find metabolism is way up here, high gross primary productivity with low respiration because algae have to breathe too. And so we expect to see high rates of respiration when there's high rates of primary productivity. They can certainly lie to the right of this autotrophic, this one-to-one -one line here. Um, but we expect, to see, uh, we expect to see a fair bit of respiration up there. OK, so here's, this is what it might look like. Um, this is what it might. This is what it might look like uh, for. This is one data set. This is the North Canadian River in Oklahoma from the Powell Center, and this is just a year's worth of data. Here's primary productivity, respiration. We see this one-to-one -one line, so the stream is autotrophic most of the time. This blue line is the is the 90% quantile regression of these data, and uh, Jake Bollier and I argue that the slope of this line represents the amount of production that is consumed on any day by, um, by respiration. And so this would be respiration of the autotrophs and then the closely associated heterotrophs. And this, in, this case, the, uh, in this case, it's around uh, about, point, about 0.5. The slope is around minus 0.5, suggesting about 50% of the carbon is getting burned on any one day. All right, so here's for a few more rivers. And so we have a Portland urban stream, uh, a dark urban stream. Uh, these are uh, probably getting a fair amount of, 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 of flow disturbance. So we see most of the points clustered around the origin. There's some, we can see high respiration, but we don't see a lot of primary productivity. Here's a Midwest river, a lot of primary productivity. A lot of the times the river is uh, autochthonous. Uh, so it's, and then uh, and a lot of clustering here during the darker times of year. There's the slopes of the quantile, about 40%, 30%, 50%. I don't know what's going on here. Um, and, and, then, uh, and, these, and, then, and then also in this Alabama stream in Texas, and this Texas River. So we're seeing that these, that, that, that these streams can occupy a pretty broad space in respiration and in uh, primary production with these excursions to these really productive times a year, and, but a lot of clustering in near the origin of unproductive times. 
All right, so here's uh, 15 years of data from this, river in, from this river in the Basque Country in Spain, and the same plot, but now we, we have a time series of it, and so going from 1997 to, uh, to more recently, and you see how the points are heading towards the origin as we go through time. Well, it turns out they built a sewage treatment plant right here, and that really lowered respiration in the river, so we see this less respiration, lower rates of primary production. And so this is, a, I think, a dramatic view of how uh, river management can alter metabolism in a river, so we end up with primary production and respiration patterns like this, and now we have them all clustered up here in the corner. All right, so how do we consider the dynamics? So, so far, I'm just sort of showing you these maps of production and respiration as a way to think about carbon cycling. But now I want to go into the dynamics of what's going on in these, uh, in these uh, rivers. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this. We're starting to do some work on this. And the first case study I'm going to give you is in the Colorado River Grand Canyon. And so the Colorado River has, uh, has these big uh, high turbidity episodes here. So this is an example of a flash flood coming in pouring in all this mud into an otherwise clear river. And this really, really drives dynamics in this, uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this river. And so here is an example of, prime, of, of this, of this uh, mul of variability through time in primary productivity. And so uh, here's primary productivity, here's turbidity here. So these are very high turbidity, low water quality. And then I took the artistic liberty of drawing the potential GPP on top there to give you an idea of what we think is happening. And so, so primary productivity would, would be this high, but it's not because of the turbidity, uh, the, the turbidity in, this, in this river. And so, okay, that's a lovely story. Is it true? Um, and so we tested this by using a semi-mechanistic time series model. And so I worked with Charles Ukulik, who is a pretty bright statistician, who uh, helped, helped me to, helped to develop this model. And what we did here is we, here we have, we, we have solar insulation coming in. And this varies through time, especially in a canyon, which has canyon walls. And so we were able, we able to control for that at all places in the canyon. And then we have these theoretical algae mats that occur at theoretical depths in the river. And so the amount of algae is a parameter. The depths that they occur is a parameter. And then, we have, uh, and then we have attenuation of light based on turbidity, which we measure at, at daily intervals in this river. So we're able to measure the effect of the turbidity on, on metabolism at, throughout, these, throughout these different depths. And because this is a time series model, we use the conditional autoregressive uh, error structure in this. I'll show you a different one in the next, in the next, in the next vignette. Um, and so when we did this, and I'll um, cut, right to the, cut right to the chase. And so here is turbidity down here. And so at high turbidity, we only see low GPP. And so when the turbidity is high, there can't be high GPP. At low turbidity, so really clear water, GPP, primary productivity, could be zero or it could be pretty high. And so I mean, that means that other stuff controls GPP. And what is this other stuff? And so we'll, 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 we'll say, all right, wintertime, when it's cloudy and with winter light, primary productivity is always low. So this is a light control. This red line here is summertime, and this is the best case scenario. And you see how it goes right on the outside of these data. Uh, there's a small hydro peaking, uh, and that's just, this is the daily raising and lowering of water in the Grand Canyon to make electricity. And so, so turbidity is the first control, but then it turns out that that, that the amount of light hitting the canyon, a little bit of temperature, then drives, this, uh, drives, the, drives the metabolism um, into, these, into this other space. Okay, the next case study is the metabolism of the Klamath River in California. And this is a collaboration with my a former student, Laurel Gensoli, Eli Assyrian. Um, and that river is that green in the summertime. It's a really, really eutrophic river. And it's eutrophic because it's, it lies below this agricultural area up here. There are four dams right here. These four dams are slated to come out. Cool. Um, and then we measured metabolism at three sites, Syad, Wechapec, and Turwar. And these are downstream in this, in, this, in this basin that has much, much less human influence on the river than relative to upstream. Um, and this is cool because the, this, this, this has been a cool project because we have data that the, cure, uh, that the 
that the uh, Yurok and the Karuk tribes collected. So they're very interested in water quality. They collected these data, these high frequency data, and then they shared them with us and even funded the study. Uh, so, so this is a, a, a kind of a nice application of taking data collected for one purpose and doing something completely different with it. Um, and so here's what, whole, here's what um, nine summers of whole river metabolism look like at three different sites. And I'm not going to tell you how we, collect, how we did the calculation with the model fitting approach that we did before, more or less. And so here's primary production, and the upper one here is respiration. First thing you notice, respiration and primary production match each other perfectly well. This river, because it sits below dams, is more or less disconnected from its watershed, and what we see is, uh, what we see is respiration and essentially mirroring production in this river. So I'm not going to talk about much about respiration and instead focus on primary, pro primary production. And so the, the questions for this part is, you know, what controls the variation in primary production in the summertime? And, and so here, again, I've got this one of these triangular plots where we have discharge on this axis and, um, and GPP, or primary productivity, on, on the y-axis. And what we have is at very, very high flows. First of all, these sounds are not out in the wintertime. If you leave sounds out in the Klamath River in the, wa in the wintertime, it gets very expensive because they're all going to go to the Pacific Ocean. And so, and so they only do this in the summer. But even in the, in the spring and the fall, you've got high discharge. So what we do is we focus just on the, on, the, on the base flow part of the summer discharge. And notice that during the base flow part, just primary production can be high or can be low. What controls this variation? And how is it tied to... How is it tied to small changes in flow during this period of time? Okay, and so what these small, interesting small changes are is that downstream of the Klamath River uh, is, is this really high nutrient water comes out. A milligram of total N per liter, about a, a tenth of a milligram of SRP. So very high nutrient concentrations. And then what happens is that these other rivers come in bringing in low nutrient concentrations. So this is almost like a permanent nutrient drip experiment. And so we have nutrients dripping out of the dam into the river, and then it's getting diluted as you go downstream. So when these tribs are running, they're diluting, and they're lowering the nutrients, even though, the, even though, the, even though the, they're not, they're not, it's not on a flow to cause a flow disturbance. Okay, so here's evidence of this point. And so here are, uh, here's the percent of discharge from the dam. And so this percent of discharge from Iron Gate Dam. And so when the percent of discharge is high, so in other words, it's all water coming from the dam, we see really high nutrient concentrations. I'm going to focus on soluble reactive phosphorus, almost as high as 0.2 milligrams per liter. And within the site, we see a relationship with flow, and then among sites. So we have high nutrients close to the dam, low nutrients far from the dam. And then we have this pattern of, uh, we have, within we can see the same relationships. And so this is true for phosphorus and nitrogen. And so take a look at the annual. So these are the annual averages for the summer, the three months in summer, July, August, and September. And so here's the mean summer base flow. Here is gross primary productivity. And for the downstream site, Turwar and Wechapec, we see these relationships where the when the flow is high, productivity is low. This flow is not high enough. It's not like, it's, it's not like this water is turbid or it's stripping algae. It's just, it's just it's diluting and giving low nutrient concentrations. Um, 2015 is a weird year. And so if you all remember, this is a huge drought year in California. And, uh, and, then, um, and then we started seeing, we started seeing, um, we started seeing fires and, and, um, and, and big sediment inputs caused by that. And then this close site here, we seem, to see this, we seem to see productivity just sort of heading south right here. And we really have no idea what's going on. And I'll, I'll make that point more clearly later about how little idea we have what's going on. OK. Uh, and then here's nutrient concentrations. And so here's SRP, total nitrogen, with, with annual estimates of primary productivity at each of these sites. Okay, so this is the annual estimate. What happens when we take a look at uh, within years? And so to do this, we need to make another multivariate model. And so this multivariate model is going to have light, and this light is based on satellite data. And so we'll have satellite data for a daily basis to calculate the solar insulation. Um, we have SRP and total nitrogen. They collect data every two weeks there. We interpolate these using a, using a load flex, a model that Allison Appling um, uh, wrote. And then, no, there's going to be no flow in this model, just nutrients. So we're not going to talk about, we're not going to talk about how, um, how, uh, how, how, we're not going to talk about the effects of, 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 of flow at all, just nutrients and light. So this is a simple model. 
Um, but we're gonna, but it's through a time series, and so you, we have to be we have to fit it a certain way. And so we're going to use a state space approach here, where there's some true but unknown measure of gross primary productivity. And so here we're taking these gross primary productivity estimates and treating them as if they were data. I know, um, and and then we are uh, and then we're but but. But, but we see what we see are these observed estimates. And so we don't know what the true is. We only know what we observe. And that's because each of these observed estimates has some observation error. And so observation error occurs, and it doesn't carry forward with time. What does carry forward with time is process error. And so as we go from the true GPP yesterday to today to tomorrow, it's going to be a function of light, nitrogen, phosphorus, and some error that is carrying forward. And so when we Fit this model to uh, fit this model to the to the data. Um, so in equation form, and I promise this is the only slide with the, well, I guess that's not true. It's the second slide with equations. Uh, uh, we have the true. This is just the state equation, not the observation equation. Uh, this is the true GPP uh, today is equal to some autoregressive parameter times yesterday, plus the plus an intercept term uh, of phosphorus uh, light total nitrogen, and here's process error. And from this, we can calculate the expected value of GPP. We fit this model hierarchically using JAG. So this is a Bayesian approach with different parameter estimates each year. So each year gets its own parameter estimate. And we justify this by the fact that these stream, this river gets ripped out by winter floods, so we don't expect carryover from year to year. And then what we do is we pooled these by calculating hyperparameters for each year. So we have some sort of a, a mean estimate of, the, of this um, of this, say, of uh, this beta one value right here, we have a mean estimate for all years, and then we have year, we have the estimate for within years. And this mean estimate is going to allow us to predict an out of sample data set, which I'll do at the very end. Okay, so how do these models fit? They fit in a medium well, I would say. And so on this axis, uh, the x-axis is measured, on the y-axis is predicted. This is the upstream site, uh, Wetchapec, and then Terroir is the downstream site. And so uh, the line is the one-to-one -one line. So we're hitting these things accurately. We're seeing these big excursions in Wetchapec. And I'll explain why on this slide. And so here's this model fit uh, is looking at the time series. And so this is just the expected values for that year's parameter estimates. So here's the year. Each one of these is a summer of three months. And we'll look at SIAG. And what we're doing is we're, we're kind of missing on the light. We seem to be wanting, to, we want, the model wants production to be much lower for the given amount of light. But we're more or less hitting the, uh, hitting the means of these. Where we're really screwing up here is on wet years in Wetchapec, where the primary productivity is still recovering from the spring snow melt, or excuse me, spring runoff. And we're not capturing that. Remember, there's no flow in this model. And so we're not able to capture that. And that's where we're seeing these big excursions in Wetchapec. In the lower site, productivity does not vary that much. And we're able to sort of hit it at every time. Uh, 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 we're, we're running right through the mean of it. OK, so let's look at the visualize the effects of the parameters. So I'm not going to uh, give you the values of the parameters, but instead show you how, how, they, how to interpret them. And so on this axis is light. And so we see, again, this triangular pattern where at high light, metabolism can be high or it can be low. At low light, it's always going to be low. And the variance in this is due to nutrients. And so this dark blue line is the nitrogen and the phosphorus effect. Uh, is, is nitrogen and phosphorus when these things are high. And this line right here is when both are low. And so when, when nutrients are low, we have low primary productivity, irregardless of what the light is. When, when nutrients are high, light is what's controlling variation in primary productivity. And the distance between here and here is the nitrogen effect. The phosphorus effect is much, much smaller. Uh, at the middle site, the phosphorus effect was 0. So I'm just going to plot the nitrogen effect. And there it is on the outside. And then here it is on the, here's the low nitrogen. These wayward points here are the ones when the flow was still high on the wet years. And so, uh, so we're not getting the flow effects. At Terroir, it turns out, the phosphorus effect here, the, the, the credible interval on this, includes zero. But I plotted it anyway just to show small phosphorus effects. So it doesn't look like there's going to be much nutrient control of metabolism down at this lower, down at this lower reach. OK, so when you want to get brave, what you do is you collect new data sets and see whether or not your model fits those new data. And so here are data from 2015. We did not use these data to fit the model. So these, this is an out-of-sample prediction. And 
And, um, and if you're going to predict, you've got to be ready to be wrong. And so here we are, wrong in SIAD. And it, the metabolism is much lower than we would predict with this very simple model that just has light and nutrients in it. I don't know why. It could be some sort of endogenous processes going on in this, uh, in this that we are not able to explain with this essentially minimal model. In Wetchapak, things are a little better. We see this really high product productivity here that we've never seen before. And then what happened is a summer storm came in and made the river really turbid. And so this decline that we're predicting here is based on clouds alone, and, but then the turbidity took a while to recover. Once it did, then our model and data fit pretty well. Turwire, we just go right smack through. I mean, even here, we have these sort of crazy fit. Um, and, and remember, this is independent. So, so for Turwar, not much happens, and we're able to predict that not much happens, um, which is great. OK, so what have we learned from this overall exercise? Um, one is that we can, uh, we can estimate metabolism for many rivers over long time series. And, uh, and we can do this with data that we use for research, or we can use this with data that other people have collected for other reasons. So in the case of the, in the, case of the Klamath River, um, uh, the case of the Klamath River, uh, it's for water quality. They're looking for DO minima. That sh uh, they're looking for DO minima, um, and not necessarily set out for uh, metabolism. Um, and, and I'm going to argue that the variation of metabolism within a stream is just as interesting as the variation among streams. And I think it's way more informative than going out and doing a single day study. I have done a lot of single day studies before. Um, I'm not going to do that anymore. And so. Oh, it's, it's with the sensors are getting cheaper, we throw these things out there and they record through time. And these time series, I think, are just a really big wealth of information. And to give you an example, of, you know, to reiterate what I mean by a wealth of information, is that here we can show how time series models show the controls of the effects of just, say, for example, light and nutrients of water clarity on metabolism. So we're starting to get an idea as to what controls this variability. And so in the case of the Klamath, we're showing how nutrients affect gross primary productivity. Now, for those of you that study lakes, you're like, wow, really? You, you discovered that nutrients affect primary productivity? <laughs> Stream ecologists are geniuses. And, uh, but in fact, in rivers, it's hard to do this. It, it, it's hard to see this effect. And it's because these other things control metabolism in rivers, light, storms, um, water clarity. And so it's sometimes hard to tease out these effects. And so we were able to tease out this effect in the Klamath River in any case. And then here, this very clear effect of putting the wastewater treatment plant controlling ecosystem respiration in the, in the Alegia River in Spain. And so we're going to suggest we're, we're entering a new era of stream metabolism studies. And so here's the year, and this is the log number of days of metabolism. Um, one of my favorite papers here by Pat Mahalan had just two days of metabolism in it. Now we're up in the, you know, somewhere above in, you know, a million, or, or excuse me, a few hundred thousand days. And so these are single day estimates. I think this is one of my studies with 11 right there. Woo! Uh, and then here's time series analysis. This is Maitha's data. Here's the USGS data. And who knows where we're headed to next as we get more and more of these data sets. And so some of the things we can test, and one of the things I kind of avoided and danced around in this talk, is this idea of disturbance and recovery. Can we build models that allow us to uh, include disturbance responses? Because some disturbance responses, some like high flows, may just temporarily shut down metabolism. So go back to the Grand Canyon again. Here's turbidity. You see this big turbidity pulse. This is from a tributary that blows out and turns the river chocolate. And you have high primary productivity goes to zero. And as the river becomes less chocolatey, it, metabolism bounces right back up again. So this is not some sort of demographic response to the algae. This is physiology. However, if the flood is big enough, it's going to strip all these algae out, and they're going to respond differently. Can we model these, these different disturbance responses? And this is one of the things we're going to try to do with this macrosystems project. Um, and so, but now, but the beauty of it is, is hey, we've got, we've got 100, 200 rivers. We've got these long time series. It's sort of like having a Hubbard Brook uh, you know, where, we t where you test these ideas of disturbance and recovery. Emily mentioned this yesterday. If you want to do disturbance and recovery, do it in a stream. They disturb all the time. They recover. We have a way to do this hundreds and thousands of times and test this effect. Um, or we will be able to once we figure out how to do this modeling. Uh, and then I'll end on this. This has been, seems to be a big uh, 
theme of the meeting so far. And this is this is the metabolism of U.S. rivers and uh, and and or, or carbon budget for U.S. rivers. This is from um, um, Butman and all's uh, recent paper. So this is the inputs, the outputs, and then here we're putting respiration in. And this respiration is one of these first estimates that we got from the Powell Center project. Here's primary productivity. This big arrow is the CO2 flux. This little arrow here is the amount coming out from respiration. And this mirrors what Aaron Hotchkiss found, where the respiration is a somewhat small fraction of total CO2 efflux. But you know, this stuff right here is dynamic. And so this is changing. And it's changing across space. And it's changing through time. And so how do these changes, how do these fine scale changes drive these, uh, drive these, uh, uh, drive um, changes in the, uh, in the CO2 efflux from from the from these rivers, and so this is another thing we we hope to to get at with this work. All right, uh, that's it's beer time, I think. So that's all I have. It is on. OK, good. So it was on all the time. Um, thank you all for this presentation. Um, I really agree that you know, we have to shift from growing from single day experiments into sensors. Um, but I was thinking about this equation that is kind of the departure point for the metabolism. So there is an equation saying, you know, oxygen depends on PAR, uh, on um, re-aeration, on all these fluxes, right? And then um, I guess the point that I don't understand very well is how if we measure one signal in the stream that is oxygen, we can separate what is happening in the connections that the surface water has with the atmosphere, with the groundwaters, with the processing that is happening inside the water, if we just track one signal. I guess my point is, should the next generation of models and uh, campaigns just try to use another signal, like for instance, PCO2, which is also uh, becoming popular? Yeah, OK. So all right, there's, a, there's, a, there's a few questions embedded in there. One is that there is the danger of equifinality in these models in terms of getting gas exchange and respiration. So you need to be aware of that when running, when, when, when calculating these things. Um, by doing this through time, we argue we can, we can be a little bit better at it because we have many, many days in which to estimate K, gas exchange. That's a physical parameter that shouldn't vary much outside of discharge. Uh, the other thing is uh, there's no groundwater term in this at all. And so we're, we're, we're pretending we're working on reaches that have no groundwater with that model that I showed you right there. And so that pretends there's no, there's no groundwater. Um, I, I know that that's not true for all rivers. And so uh, that, you know, ideally what happens is that original, that initial oxygen model I showed you, that was one type of model. And, and you, me, and everyone else is free to think of other ways of doing it. And, and package that we have now has got, already got several formulations of this model of this model in it. So the short answer to your question is, yes, we should be thinking about what the new models look like, always being aware of, of whether or not we can parameterize them. And having PCO2 would be a good way of doing it. And so for this new macro systems project, we are measuring POC, POCO2 with oxygen. Earlier today, you saw Erin give her talk. She used another proxy. Um, uh, uh, and that a uh, data set, and that would be O18. So we could do that. A little tougher to get long time series of O18 without getting really big bags under your eyes because you got to collect them by staying up all night. 